Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first lap of your Access Me web seminars. Um, I'm the country representative for your Access Japan. My name is Yudita Rika Magyar, and uh, I would like to welcome our two distinguished uh, speakers for this evening. Our first presenter is uh, Sven Sala, who is the director of the graduate program in global studies, um, the professor in modern Japanese history at Sofia University and the co-editor at the Asia Pacific journal, the Japan Focus. He's going to talk about Men in Metal, a topography of public bronze sanctuary in modern Japan. Let me just um, give the floor to him. Yes, there you go, Sven. Yes, thank you, Judith, for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak here uh, tonight. Um, I am a historian of modern Japan and I am based in Tokyo at Sofia University. And uh, si since uh, almost 20 years, I've been researching um, Japanese history, but uh, more than um, actual history, I've been looking at how history is being represented in the public sphere in contemporary uh, Japan, so a field we also um, um, call uh, public history. Um, today I'm going to introduce to you my, my latest book, um, so thank you Judith for giving me the chance to um, uh, introduce this today, a book with the title Man in Metal, the Topography of Public uh, Statuary in Modern uh, Japan. You can see here the um, title, um, the cover of this book, which is in the press right now and should uh, come out in one or two months. So um, the book looks at um, the history of uh, monuments dedicated to historical personalities in modern Japan. Um, in having many of these statues, those of you who have been uh, traveling in Japan maybe have seen these statues um, everywhere. There are uh, several thousand of these um, statues uh, today. And Japan, of course, is in no way unique uh, wherever you travel, whether you go to London, to Paris, or Washington, to DC, or any other major or not so major city, you will find statues uh, as the ones you can see here statues of ancient uh, forefathers and, and semi-legendary figures, uh, statues of medieval heroes and statues of uh, modern founding figures of modern states, like of course here on the screen on the right, most famously the Lincoln Memorial. Um, before I come to Japan, um, what I'm doing in my book and also um, tonight in this talk is to talk about um, statues at, as instruments of political indoctrination. So statues, of course, are also sculpture uh, is a, a piece of art. Um, but what is very important uh, to keep in mind is that statues of historical personalities in most countries are being mainly used for political purposes and the art dimension is, uh, uh, in most cases, uh, secondary. Um, you can see that in many countries, like again in the examples here on the screen, uh, statues of uh, uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, but also uh, statues representing the Bismarck cult in imperial uh, Germany uh, before the First World War. Um, if we look at Japan, uh, these are some famous examples. Uh, maybe some of you have visited Tokyo and have seen uh, the statue of Saigo Takamori here on the left in the famous Ueno Park, or the statue here on the middle, which is standing in a shrine called the Yaskuni Shrine. Um, these are uh, statues that we find all over Japan. And uh, since many years, I was interested in who are these um, people and is there any system 
behind the large number of uh, statues that were built in modern Japan. Uh, in terms of numbers, uh, between 1880 and 1940, so before World War II, um, almost 800 statues were built all over Japan. Most of them were destroyed in World War II, uh, but uh, after World War II, again, several thousand statues were built, partly reproductions of pre-war statues, partly new statues. Um, people who, um, um, researchers who study uh, monuments and uh, the memorial culture, the historical memory of uh, modern nations usually look at single cases and they analyze case studies. Because of the large number of statues, um, I decided to take a double approach. I um, did look at a certain case studies of particularly prominent uh, statues, um, but I also designed a database and compiled data of um, about 2,000 monuments built in Japan between 1880 and uh, 2015. And uh, with this, it was possible to answer some of the questions, the, the larger questions, uh, the macro perspective of uh, these monuments and their role in modern Japan. So um, rather than looking at single individuals, it was possible for me um, to look at um, um, the categories of people who are um, who are depicted in bronze statues. Um, and here you see a categorization that I came uh, up with. Um, and you see that the majority of statues um, depicts the two categories, politicians and uh, samurai. Um, these two categories do overlap to a certain degree. Um, samurai are, of course, the members of Japan's pre-modern military aristocracy, which was abolished in 1871. But um, quite a few of the statues that I categorized um, here as uh, samurai after 1871 actually became uh, politicians. Some of them also became military officers. Uh, so some of these categories overlap and some of the statues that I categorized were given two or three categories. But it is quite obvious um, that uh, in the statuary that we see in Japan, these political figures, political leaders are in the majority. Then I matched uh, this category with the year of birth of the person depicted in a monument and it showed that clearly there was a um, strong majority of people who were born in what we call the Edo period, um, the, the, the period between 1600 and 1867. So, um, um, and uh, when I, these were about 1000 um, people depicted in a statue were born in this period and actually half of those, um, actually more than half of it, so more than 500 statues depicted people who were born in the three decades uh, from 1820 to 1850. So this was a very um, strong characteristic coming out of the quantitative analysis. And uh, this did lead me to the conclusion that in Japanese statuary, you have a very strong representation of the history of the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration of 1868, sometimes you will also find the uh, term Meiji Revolution. The term Meiji Restoration is being used because in this year, in 1868, the um, um, shogunate, the military government, um, was overthrown. And uh, at least in terms of rhetoric, the emperor was reinstated as the direct ruler of Japan. Um, however, interestingly, um, the emperor was um, then in the 19th century and basically all the way until World War II uh, defined and treated as a sacred being because the imperial dynasty, according to the pre-war um, ideology, had its roots in the sun goddess. So the current emperor was also a living god. And that is why uh, Emperor Meiji and uh, most other emperors were not actually being depicted in the statuary. So if you think about European countries, you very often have the current or at least uh, the previous emperor being depicted 
uh, in the public space on pedestals in form of sculpture. In Japan, uh, it was uh, a taboo to show the emperor. So we have basically uh, no statues, public statues um, of uh, particular Emperor Meiji until 1968. And this is, of course, the 100th anniversary of the Meiji restoration. Before that, there were no statues of Emperor Meiji. And this invisibility of the emperor in public space did lead to the growth of a public statuary depicting other um, figures, other historical personalities. And this is, again, very similar to the European example. And of course, there were direct connections to what uh, European countries did at that time. So Japan also followed European examples and built statues of founding fathers, of ancient forefathers of the Japanese nation, of war heroes from the Russo-Japanese War, for example, or modern national heroes. Um, as already mentioned before, um, the number was um, huge um, and um, increasing. Uh, Japan had a, a slow start in the uh, early Meiji period. So until 1900, only relatively few statues were built in Japan, uh, partly because um, the, techno the technology of um, Western uh, sculpture, Western style sculpture was not yet um, available. Um, but as you can see here in the 1910s and 1920s, uh, um, every year um, 30 to 40 statues uh, were built in Japan, uh, reaching a climax in 1927 with 48 statues, basically one a statue per week built in Japan. Um, this had uh, uh, also to do, of course, that Japan was uh, uh, experiencing an e economic boom in the 1910s and uh, to a certain degree also in the 1920s. So um, the um, resources, uh, the material resources for building statues also became available. If you look at after 1930, here you see very few statues are built. This is, of course, uh, because Japan enters a period of war and needs its metal resources for something different than for public sculpture. And in post-war Japan, um, again, uh, as you can see in the 1950s, uh, people are still a little bit reluctant to build uh, statues. Uh, the same in the 1960s, although uh, the number of statues is growing. Then we have again a slump here in the 1970s because of the economic crisis following the oil shock of 1971. Um, but then in the 1980s, when Japan is considered econom economically as number one, um, the uh, uh, Japan builds more uh, statues, partly also as an expression of the new one national pride as a leading economic power. Um, I mentioned before that um, the emperor was uh, generally not depicted in um, um, statuary. Um, if you travel in Japan, you will see a number of um, emper uh, imperial statues, um, though. Most of these go back to the early Meiji period um, because uh, the Japanese authorities at that time did find uh, some proxies which, with which they uh, compensated for the invisibility of the current uh, emperor. So uh, you will find some uh, ancient figures from Japanese mythology, which were, however, built in the 1880s and 1890s as uh, statues of historical uh, personalities because Japanese mythology was considered uh, history until the end of World War II. I have to hurry up a little bit here. Um, one uh, question is how efficient these um, statues are as a means of disseminate a certain ideology or certain values. As I mentioned at the beginning, I consider these statues not so much pieces of art, but rather instruments of um, indoctrination of uh, the people. And uh, one has to take into consideration here that these statues, of course, are efficient beyond the site where they actually stand. There were a number of very famous statues like this statue of a medieval warrior who sacrificed his life for the emperor in the early 14th century and therefore in pre-war Japan was considered a model of loyalty and self-sacrifice. And his statue featured in all kind of 
uh, different uh, media. We find it, as you can see here, on uh, the cover of uh, magazines in uh, advertisement. This here in the middle is advertisement for a toothpaste. Um, actually, his uh, statue was also reproduced on a Japanese um, um, currency uh, bill in um, the, uh, during World War II actually. So um, these um, um, statues were used beyond the place where they actually stood. However, during World War II, and I already mentioned that at the beginning, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, army, the Japanese military eventually decided that uh, material, raw materials are more important than ideological indoctrination. So almost all of the 870, 700 to 800 statues that were built before 1940 were um, taken down from their pedestals, as you can see here in this uh, rare photograph on the right, two statues being taken down to their pedestal and brought uh, to being melted down. So they were melted down and they were, um, and the bronze that um, um, was one from that was used to produce ammunition. So after the end of World War II in 1945, only less than 100 statues had actually um, survived um, from the pre war period, but they have been being rebuilt uh, ever since, as you saw before in the um, statistic uh, statistics graph that I showed before. Um, and this is going on until today. This is, for example, a photograph from an unveiling ceremony of a statue of a, a feudal lord, a daimyo, in the city of Saga in uh, Kyushu. And uh, I took this photograph two years um, ago. So you can still, still see that some cities um, invest um, a lot of money to reproduce statues that um, existed before the war, but uh, disappeared as a result of total mobilization during World War II. Um, yeah, I was given only 15 minutes, uh, so I think uh, this is already, uh, I'm already at um, the end. Uh, thank you for your attention. And um, as mentioned at the beginning, the details of this you can all, all find in this new and uh, very soon forthcoming book, Men in Metal, which will be published in a few months and which uh, contains the complete story of the uh, uh, building of monuments. Uh, dedicated to historical personalities in modern Japan. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy now to answer uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Sven. Um, may I encourage uh, our audience to type their questions in the uh, question slot, um, if you may. If um, you can't think of any questions at the moment, you may also submit them to uh, japan at eurofsas.net uh, at a later stage. Uh, in any case, I'm going to um, have a look. Okay, so uh, there is one question. Are there considerably more statues compared to um, other countries? And the um, person is saying, yes, um, Sven might have said that uh, at an earlier stage. Yeah, our hmm. viewer might have um, entered the room a bit later. Yes. Hmm. Any comments? Yeah. There? Um, uh, yes, um, I, I, I didn't say it. Um, it. It's difficult to compare, of course, because of the size of countries, the number of major cities. Um, but Japan uh, seems to be pretty regular. It's it's quite interesting that actually my book is the first um, study of of any kind of monuments uh, that includes um, um, a very um, and includes a quantitative um, analysis based on a large uh, database. Um, so in in some uh, countries, of course, we have catalogues and lists of monuments in public space. Uh, and I know that, for example, in the United States, um, the number 
of um, monuments dedicated to persons is much higher than in Japan, but of course that is partly the result of the larger size of the United States and the larger number of um, cities, although cities as such tend to be smaller than in Japan. Uh, but in the United States too, you have thousands of um, statues. Um, and of course, that this is one uh, thing where uh, people have become uh, sensitive to the political um, um, a background of these uh, monuments that uh, two years um, ago um, there were um, some cities in the south of the United States uh, which demolished uh, statues that uh, represented uh, generals or politicians from the Confederacy. Um, and um, um, this was of course only um, about a small number of statues, only those Confederate statues, but of course there are also statues in uh, the north of the United States, um, which are not being uh, discussed. Um, so I think from what I'm feeling, and I, and I haven't done comparative research in terms of quantitative analysis, because I haven't found any quantitative analysis regarding other countries, but Japan seems to be pretty standard. So it's not that it's particularly many or particularly few um, statues, modern nation states, um, and, and that is something I mentioned at the beginning, uh, do this quite routinely, that they do build uh, uh, monuments dedicated to historical personalities to represent the national history in public space and to use these um, statues to um, um, indoctrinate the population with um, a certain set of values that uh, the current political uh, order considers um, fundamental for the uh, polity. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, for um, okay, at this yeah. point. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Sven. And um, you're going to give the floor to um, our next uh, uh, presenter. Okay, he's a uh, Buddha de Tia Pine, and he's going to talk about a very different topic. Uh, entering the new age of synthetic aperture radar, JAXA Microx is SAR mission overview. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Judith, for the kind introduction and inviting me today for giving this talk. So, uh, firstly, um, good evening to all the viewers from Japan and good morning to those in Europe and across the globe. So I'm Buda Pine and I'm an RF engineer in a Japanese based startup company called um, Synspective. And today I will talk about uh, a growing trend in the, in the new space sector that is the evolution of the synthetic aperture radar in the industry. So I'll give a brief overview of the JAXA Micro XR mission. So a uh, brief uh, introduction about myself. So I'm from the eastern part of India called Calcutta or Kolkata as it's well known now, where I did my undergrad, after which I came to Japan for my master's and PhD in the University of Tokyo. That's how I got involved with JAXA and the IMPACT program, uh, which made me work in the Micro XR mission. And after graduation, I've joined the startup called Inspective Aim, which is a spin-off from JAXA and the University of Tokyo. So first, we need to understand, of course, um, what is the synthetic aperture radar and why we need to use it. So the beautiful Google Earth images that you see on the internet, they use the optical imagery. And although they are very nice to see, you can't see them and the, at night and also during cloud cover. So these are major drawbacks, whereas radar imagery utilizes the higher frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum to penetrate to the clouds and also capable of getting image at night. So this is a major um, advantage and also the resolution is independent of the altitude. However, the one of the drawbacks of typical radars has been that to get high resolution SAR image, you need a very long antenna, which is very difficult to manufacture and also very costly. However, in synthetic aperture radar, we utilize the platform of the satellite motion to artificially simulate or synthesize a very large aperture as if a very large virtual antenna 
and thus we can get high resolution SAR image for a relatively small physical antenna size. And this is the key bay breakthrough here. So um, to brief explain a little bit, um, well, the SAR generates a two dimensional image. So the two dimensions are one along the direction of motion of the satellite, that is the azimuth direction, and the other is perpendicular to the motion of the satellite, that is the range direction. So the satellite will transmit a signal and the signal will get reflected from the Earth's surface and come back to the satellite. So points in the range direction for a side looking radar can be differentiated by, depending on the time of reception of the echo signal. So the one which is located nearer will come back to the satellite faster. However, in the azimuth direction, things can get a little bit tricky. So to understand this, let me simplify it like this. Like imagine you're stationary standing and a train is approaching you. And you know that the sound of the train is increasing in frequency while the train is approaching you, while it is decreasing in frequency as it is going away from you. So this is what is well known as the Doppler effect. And similarly, using the Doppler frequency of the uh, received signal, we can distinguish between two points in the azimuth direction. And thus, we can generate a two-dimensional SAR image. And application-wise, um, there are many applications, one very important being disaster monitoring. So the picture in the middle, it shows the PALSAR2, that is the phased array L-band synthetic aperture radar number two, or ALOS of the JAXA. So it shows the volcanic crater at Mount Otake. And the circle area shows the land deformation. So this is a useful information for us. So how do we generate the SAR image? So unlike um, optical image where you just snap a picture and you can see the pretty image on your phone or uh, on your camera, it doesn't work so simply in case of radar. For example, the antenna transmits and receives and the raw data looks like this, which is nothing but pixels and looks pretty terrible actually but from from which we need to do a lot of signal processing i won't go into the details but firstly when we do the first level of signal processing we get a single look complex image it looks like this in black and white and then if necessary depending on the application we can do advanced star processing and get for example interferograms which depend on the phase of the signal as well and how do we um, interpret a star image so star image is inherently black and white not in color as we are used to seeing. So the intensity of the reflection depends on the characteristics of the ground surface. So the scattering characteristics per se. So there are basically three types of scattering. One is for example, volume scattering, which is quite diffuse. So signal is reflected in more or less uniformly in all directions as happens when, you, when the target area is a forest, field, vegetation, etc. Or it can be surface scattering like the smooth surfaces of the oceans, the roof, roads, and double bound scattering where the signal reflects twice and comes back more in strongly to the satellite. So when we see a very bright spot in a SAR image, we can interpret it as maybe buildings or bridges. If we see a very dark area, we can imagine it must be a smooth surface like water or roof. And if we see not very dark, but not very bright, then it can be forest, fields, and vegetation. So uh, let's look at the historical background of SAR satellites. So as you may know, radar was actually discovered during World War II, and it was used for warfare. So SAR was actually initially used for airborne systems for finding aircrafts, ship monitoring, and so on. But the first time that SAR was used for spaceborne application was by NASA in 1978 by the CSAT SAR L-band system. So it was very big, 1.8 tons, huge antenna size and coarse resolution and high cost. Of course, as time has moved on, technology, technology has improved, but one common trend in traditional SAR systems is that it is used on very big satellites, which weigh more than a ton and cost several hundred million US dollars. And the most, uh, the gold standard of SAR system is the TerraSAR X, the X-band DLR system. And you can see the antenna size, resolution, and cost, and this justifies it. But over the last decade, with advanced, rapid advancements in the miniaturization of satellite technology, uh, it's become, uh, people have tried to uh, build SAR sensors on board small satellites. An example being the NovaSAR S-band system by the UK Space Agency in 2015, which weighed 400 kilograms. 
and resolution was up to six meters and the cost was still about 80 million dollars so in 2012 2013 in jaxa and the cabinet of japan we came up with a very ambitious and uh, innovative idea of uh, being able to Hello, can you hear me, Judith? Uh, yes, I can. I'm, I, I'm afraid there was a system glitch. Uh, so uh, would you mind beaming up your presentation uh, again? Uh, from, from which part, from which point? Uh, basically, it's okay. Um, uh, from slide six, I believe, or uh, yes, slide six, that, that should be okay, okay. Okay, all right, no problem. Sorry about that. No problem. So screen sharing is on or not yet? Uh, it it doesn't show up at my end. Because I don't know. Uh, can you resend me the screen sharing option like before? Uh, actually, I'm I'm trying, but the system uh, the system is not letting me um, reset. So let me try. Okay, I think I can see my screen here in the small window. So maybe it's on. Yes, it's I'm, on. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but yes, it's it's on. You just need to press. Uh, slideshow from beginning oh from current slide so but we can from see slide number, from slide number six right to be precise yeah, yes yes mm. oh, okay thank you right yes thank you uh, apparently you disappeared from my system so that must be a glitch i'm sorry about that oh, okay no problem otherwise i think we can see him okay great, uh, great, at, great. at least i can but i'm not sure yeah <laughs> Right, um, um, sorry to the viewers for the uh, technical glitch there. So I'll just uh, briefly summarize this slide again. So uh, historically, um, radar was first invented during the World War and uh, it was used, and SAR systems was used in airborne planes to identify other aircrafts and ship monitoring, etc. So the first time that SAR system was used on a spaceborne satellite was in 1978 by the NASA L-band SAR system called CSAT. So it was a very heavy uh, system and very large antenna and coarse resolution and reasonably high cost as well. So of course, as time has moved on and technology has improved, the system capacity has improved. For example, the gold standard of SAR is TerraSARX by DLR, um, but still the weight is more than a ton and it's more than a hundred million dollars. So Generally, the trend is that SAR systems are used on board very big satellites, which cost a lot. But in the last decade, with rapid advancements in miniaturization of satellite technology and electronic components, um, efforts have been made to install SAR sensors on board small satellites. For example, for the NOVASAR S mission of the UK Space Agency in 2015, but still the weight is um, 400 kilos, less than a thousand, but still not so, not so small. But in 2012-2013, the um, Japanese uh, JST uh, decided to come up with the impact program and we came up with a very um, ambitious project what, that is to get one meter resolution for a 100 kilogram class satellite at a very low cost, less than 20 million US dollars. And um, at that point, that was the, it was going to be the first of its kind to be able to uh, develop such a system. So the uh, the mission goal was to get a constellation of several such small satellites so that um, whenever a disaster occurs, we can get near real-time monitoring and data within a couple of hours um, using the SAR satellites. And using that data, policymakers and disaster mitigators could take important decisions like evacuation and help in saving people's lives. 
because still now disasters mostly happen in developing countries which are not have their enough capabilities so they depend on the developed nations and there's a lot of time lag which results in delayed decision making and loss of lives so this was a very novel cause to try to solve by using uh, such a mission and as an example um, if you have um, 36 satellites and with six orbital planes then we get 12 times per day as an observation rate which is quite good um, some traditionalists might say that um, you can just send three big satellites in the geostationary orbit and you can monitor the whole earth well that is technically true but the cost would be enormous and still the poor the developing countries would not be able to afford such a system so from that perspective getting a constellation of small satellites is very important so this is a, a, a block diagram overview of the japan cabinet office r d program uh, which was the pioneer of this micro xr mission it was headed by the prime minister's office cabinet office in japan and a satellite system consists of several small subsystems for example you have the satellite bus development the SAR antenna development and also the data processing and business development so i was involved in the antenna development um, under professor saito who was my phd supervisor at the time and, and that's how i came to be in part of this uh, impact program since 2013. so uh, this shows a more detailed overview of our satellite so the interesting thing is that the satellite is deployable. That means that when it is launched, it looks quite small like this. So it can be stored in a CubeSat, which is 70 centimeters in each direction. And after launching using the hinges and flange, it is going to deploy automatically and get data from the Earth. So the antenna is a passive traveling wave slot array antenna. And the reverse side of the antenna is shown here has the feeding network waveguide system, um, which is a unique and first of its kind, the center feeding system. So actually, this was actually my um, PhD dissertation work to develop this kind of uh, new system uh, of feeder network. And uh, another interesting thing is that con the power transmission between two panels occurs in a contactless manner without physical contact using a choke plant. The reason is that once it's the, the satellite is deployed in space, when it is facing towards the sun, there would be thermal expansion. And if there is not enough gap, then the two surfaces may collide and the antenna may break. So for this, we designed uh, very carefully a uh, choke plant as well. And uh, these are our uh, basic uh, parameters. So once it is in the low Earth orbit, around 600 kilometers, then it can look down on the Earth's surface and acquire image of 100 and uh, sorry, uh, one meter resolution and 28 kilometers swath width. So this was a very novel idea and very unique. And we already have a Japanese and uh, American patent uh, for the choke flange and this feeder network. So the outcome, the outcome was this uh, prototype flight model, uh, deployable antenna. So this is from last year this image where we are doing the deployment test of the antenna to make sure that after reaching a space it deploys as expected and it did and this was a very proud moment for the whole team and also very satisfying moment for me because this was basically my <laughs> phd work as well and uh, so the impact program ended in um, march 2019 and as uh, uh, carrying on the legacy of the successful program, a new space startup company called Synspective was established in February 2018 by Dr. Arai and Professor Shirasaka. And the, our mission is to develop a constellation of roughly maybe 80 SAR satellites with near real-time Earth observation applications, which can cater to the demands of the government, private, commercial, and the private sector. And the Strix is the name of the constellation. Uh, this was used because Strix is the scientific name of OWL, and we know that OWL can see at night, so hence the name. The key feature is that uh, this startup company has the capability of developing both the hardware for the SAR sensor and also provide software-based solution as a ser service called SAAS or SAS in a subscription-like manner. 
because uh, the end users, they don't necessarily want the complicated start data. They want the information regarding how much um, inundation has happened or subsidence has happened, etc. So uh, our solutions team works on that uh, area as well. And as a result, uh, we are able to provide competitive pricing of SAR image in the market. So as an achievement, uh, we were in the news in the in the space news a lot last year because we were the fastest company in the world uh, to reach 100 million USD in July. And our first launch, that is Trix Alpha, this will be the first demonstration satellite carrying the micro XR antenna, the one shown in the previous slide. Uh, it is expected to be launched in um, the end of this year, but of course we have to monitor the COVID-19 situation to see uh, how things go on. Now, presently, we have grown rapidly as a startup company founded only two years ago. So now we have almost um, 80 employees from 20 different countries. And location-wise, the main uh, location is, of course, Kiyosumi Shirakawa in uh, Tokyo. But the satellite development still goes on in the Jackson Sakamihara campus, where I have been working for nearly seven years now. And uh, this shows like how many different applications we have with the SAR image beyond the military. So this is finding new market for SAR, hence we call the new age of SAR systems. So for urban planning, finance, disaster mitigation, infrastructure development, et cetera. So just to give you an example that during drought uh, the, and during very heavy rainfall and floods, the crops can get seriously affected. So how much damage the crops have can be measured by comparing the SAR images before and after the natural disaster. And this is, information is very useful for farmers, for government, for the private sector, and also for the uh, agricultural insurance. So that's how it is quite useful. So the picture on the right is with the flight model antenna where we are doing the antenna measurement test in uh, Amit Lab in Kyoto University Uji campus. And the one on the left is a scaled uh, model. So one is to one scaled uh, model of a satellite, which was in the international uh, uh, remote sensing symposium called IGARS last year in Yokohama. And um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it from me. So if you have any questions, comments, uh, please feel to share. And if you have further interest, feel free to check out our website and our emails. And you can also Google um, uh, Suspective in YouTube and you can see an uh, interesting two minute video. So thank you for your time. And I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, very interesting indeed. Um, I am sure that those who are in your field uh, might have questions. May I encourage our audience to submit their questions in writing? Um, you can do so in the questions panel. Alternatively, um, you can send an email to Buddha at hello at sinspactive.com. Um, just to be clear, the uh, if you want to send me an email, you should send me an email to the first slide here. So, okay, let us see the, that address then. Yeah, so this one. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, any questions? So, so far, I do not see any in the system. Uh, yes, there is one question. How much of data processing is done on board with respect to data actually gathered and transmitted? Well, actually, we are trying to, we have a plan of doing on board, so data processing in space, actually, in future. So uh, right now, it's more traditional way for the first couple of satellites where the data will be first coming to the ground stations and we will get data from different ground stations at different parts of the world and then do processing there. But our goal is to use AI, artificial intelligence, on board the satellite itself and thereby reduce a lot of constraints so we can get uh, much faster processing and quicker re near real-time imagery. Thank you very much. Any other questions? We still have approximately two minutes. Okay, I do not see any other questions at this point uh, to stream in. However, the system is telling me uh, that the networks is uh, rather slow, so uh, that might also be a problem. Oh, there is one more question. Um, how are the satellite uh, circuits uh, powered up? Okay, 
So the satellite is powered by a centralized power system called the X-band power amplifier. So the main satellite body uh, feeds is fed by that. It has uh, one kilowatt right now, though in future we may increase the power level. And then using the feeder network, the power is uniformly distributed among each of the antenna panels using the waveguide feeder network. So this is not a distributed system because this is a passive system, passive antenna, so centralized. Whereas active antennas, you can have a distributed network where each antenna can have its own power amplifier and amplify the power accordingly. But this is centralized, passive, uh, traveling wave antenna. Okay, and the final question, how do you deal with uh, backscattering? Right, so backscattering, it uh, depends on the region of uh, interest, really. So, for example, um, if you're wanting to observe climate change over the ocean surface, then it's going to be um, surface scattering. So for that, we don't need high resolution. We need low resolution wide swath. Whereas if we are interested in monitoring agricultural crops, so then we need high resolution narrow swath. So accordingly, we uh, adjust our parameters, like for example, the off nadir look angle and the chirp processing bandwidth, et cetera, uh, to adjust according to the application of interest. Thank you very much. I, I'm afraid that's all we had time for. Um, I would like to thank both of you for uh, the very interesting uh, presentations. And um, I'm hoping to see you in some of our uh, webinars in the future. Again, thank you very much also uh, to, your, to our audience. Thank you for coming and taking time to be with us. Uh, may I encourage you to participate in our future webinars as well. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you to fill out the survey, which uh, will uh, be up at you after our webinar ended. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you for yes. organizing this. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night.